Hello and welcome to the webinar that we are doing on combining crop and disease modeling with numerical weather forecasting to inform wheat blast early warning systems in Bangladesh, Brazil, and beyond. And I'm Timothy Krupnik and I'm presenting with my colleague Mauricio Fernandez in Brazil and I am uh, presenting from Bangladesh. And we're very pleased to give you this presentation, which was put together with support from a number of different projects, but uh, specifically for this webinar with the CGIAR platform for big data in agriculture. But we've also done this work through support on various projects, such as the Climate Services for Resilient Development Project, which is aligned with CCAFs, but funded by USAID, and also through the Serial Systems Initiative for South Asia, or CISA project. We're very pleased to give you this presentation and it's an update on the work that we've been doing and some of its applicability, and we hope that you enjoy it. So in this presentation, we'll give you a quick introduction and background on wheat blast disease, which is the topic for today. We'll talk about our cross-continental collaboration, some of our accomplishments so far, the work that we've done on wheat blast early warnings and integrating our wheat blast early warning systems with DSAT and crop modeling. We'll give you a practical example of a sowing date trial in Bangladesh where we have tried to apply some of this work. And then we'll talk about coupling disease and crop models to both to assess yield losses and, and geographic variation in yield losses in Brazil. Before we conclude with uh, our major insights from this work so far and mention a few necessary acknowledgements. So to introduce the topic for today, we're talking about wheat blast disease or Magnaporte arisi pathotype triticum. And this is a physiologically um, and genetically complex disease that can infect many different kinds of grasses, but uh, specific isolates will tend to affect specific species and we are particularly interested in the wheat crop. Um, Magnaporte arise pathotype triticum, or MOT, was first identified in Brazil in the mid-1980s, where it affected a large number of several million hectares over time, with variations in the population and impact of the disease depending on year versus year. But it became a very big concern for those of us working on wheat systems in South Asia, in 2016 when wheat blast was found uh, in Bangladesh. And it was a, a very sudden infection that occurred in February of 2016. And it was very, very shocking to those of us who saw it when it occurred in the field. And it very rapidly affected 15 districts with recorded yield losses up to 51% in that time. And since then, we have been lucky to not have um, a major significant outbreak per se of wheat blast in Bangladesh but we have consistently observed that the fungal spores of wheat blast are in the environment, and we are observing um, regular small-scale infections in key areas where wheat is grown and where the disease was a problem in 2016. And so combined with having the susceptible host, which is wheat, and knowing that the pathogen is there through the spores that we are observing in the environment, We've done work to look at the conducive environment for disease, and that's been work on weather forecasting and weather models uh, to try to understand and predict if and when wheat outbreaks, uh, wheat blast outbreaks may occur again in the future. So to give you a few fundamentals of wheat blast ecology and epidemiology, this graphic gives you some, some sense of, of how it works, but basically, um, while wheat blast can be um, born on seeds, the, the main route of inf infection is through airborne dispersal of spores. Um, spores are released after development and dispersed, and then they deposit onto the crop canopy. Um, and specifically, wheat blast can affect the wheat spikes, where it will cause bleaching of grain and a complete yield loss above the point of infection, typically, or if it's a late infection, it will cause shriveling of grain um, above the point of, uh, of infection on, um, on a wheat spike. But what's important to notice on this is that there are cardinal temperatures for the disease and specific conditions for um, the disease that will, will favor its, its development more so than others. And that allows us as scientists to try to understand how the disease might affect the crop and actually to predict 
the crop and uh, the crop risk to the disease and provide useful and actionable information as a result. So the background on our work is that this has been a, a cross-continental collaboration between myself and Mauricio and a number of other colleagues. I should mention that we're working very closely with the Bangladesh uh, Agri Agricultural Research Institute, the Bangladesh Meteorological Department, and also with the Bangladesh Wheat and Maize Improvement uh, uh, Institute, or BWMRI, whereas Mauricio works uh, very closely with the University of Passo Fundo in Brazil, and also with Embrapa. And I myself work for uh, the International Wheat and Maize Improvement Center in, in Bangladesh. So combined with the support from the big data uh, platform, we've been able to put this collaboration together and take the best of the work that's been done in Brazil, where Mauricio was already working on wheat blast disease modeling and epidemiology, and bring that knowledge across the continents all the way to the other side of the globe, where we started to work on um, wheat blast prediction in Bangladesh and in South Asia. And other colleagues, as you've seen, um, this is done by a colleague of mine named uh, Kondikar Motilab, some work that was done earlier, has assessed large-scale potential risks and environmental suitability for wheat blast disease across South Asia, where we, we see a large area that could, could be vulnerable to, Z, to the disease. Um, but there's a real need to understand much more the triggers and when the disease might occur and if and when it, and how it's possible to alert both farmers and extension agent and policymakers and others of the risks of disease so we can prepare in advance. So some of what we've accomplished so far in this collaboration of a few years has been that we have developed a weather-based risk forecasting model that integrates forecasts from uh, the numerical weather models and the WARF models produced by the Bangladesh Meteorological Department. And it looks at temperature, it looks at relative humidity, and it looks at precipitation. And those variables drive a disease growth model that allows us to predict in the future days when infection may occur, and also allows us to examine historical information in the past as to when wheat blast disease has occurred and try to understand the environmental suitability for the disease in Bangladesh. And you'll see down here that there's a website listed where you can go and have a look at this model. Um, what's important and unique about it is the model allows you to look at the data in detail, but it also allows you to map the data. And you can look at the information for both Bangladesh and also for Brazil. So it, it serves both countries. And we're very pleased to say that now the extension department in Bangladesh is going to start making use of advice that comes from this model for warning farmers and, and extension agents of the risks of disease in 2020 forward, whereas the work of Mauricio in Brazil has also seen piloting of the same tool in Brazil. In addition to that, Mauricio's team in Brazil has done a lot of work in developing apps for monitoring of the disease. And you see that here in the Pick a Wheat Field app, which has its URL here and allows users to identify uh, fields and locations and take photographs of where uh, wheat blast has occurred and that becomes useful as a database for examining the disease risks more broadly. So this has generated a little bit of news and we're, we're very proud of this work and we think that it's useful, it's, it's, it's good research science, but more importantly, it's been work that's been, been positioned to take the best data insights and the models that we've been working on and position them for, for use. Uh, here you can see additional information on, on how the use of the, uh, this work will be used in Bangladesh and you can see some of the maps and suitability maps for wheat blast disease that result from application of the models so far, and text message alerts that go out, for example, by SMS in Brazil, um, alerting farmers and extension agents and other users when and where the disease may strike. But with that, I will pass over to my colleague Mauricio, who will tell you about our integration of these tools with crop models and how that's been enabled by the support of the big data platform. <coughs> Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to, to be here today with Tim to talk about uh, our work. And uh, so one challenge that we had to the work was that uh, besides being able to uh, predict uh, the disease outbreaks, the risk of outbreaks, we would like also to 
estimate the impact that disease would have on the crop, okay, uh, about the yield uh, impact. Well, to do that, we need to integrate disease model to crop models, okay? And the idea of this integration is that we can have a, a crop model, let's say a process-based crop model, uh, that's gonna provide the disease model and the success, susceptible host tissue. And uh, here we are gonna use the same idea, uh, the principles of uh, human epidemiology with uh, the SIR models, uh, susceptible infection and removal. And uh, so you have, uh, and that's the, the idea that we are putting together to integrate this uh, disease to crop models. Next. Uh, so we have uh, uh, one of, uh, early on, my, one of my students, uh, prof today Professor Pavel, uh, put this together was a, we call an equation-based genetic plant disease cycle model. The idea is that this, this uh, disease cycle model is generic and uh, in theory it, it could be applied to any disease or any pathogen. And uh, so just change, we need to change the a set of parameters and these parameters are uh, in a file outside of the model, okay, so that's, it, it, that's uh, it makes it easier to co configure uh, for a configuration. So we had this uh, this model in disease cycle. Next, and uh, we also have uh, uh, crop models. Uh, let's say uh, uh, I've been working a lot with this uh, with DSAT and uh, DSAT developers and uh, DSAT is uh, the decision support system for agri-technology transfer. It's a widely used uh, uh, platform. And uh, this, is a, this platform has a, a group of uh, a set of crop models. And uh, also in this platform, uh, there is, there is a, a built-in pest module, or it means it's, it's a module that connects, uh, that I can connect, we can connect uh, to the crop model and uh, uh, key points, uh, coupling points in the crop model, so we can penalize growth and yield, for example. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not present uh, in every uh, crop model in the SAT. So we, we are using uh, NWIT, one of the TSAT models that uh, simulates the growth and development of wheat. And we, are, we modified in wheat now that in wheat has this uh, uh, ability uh, of uh, using the best module. So now we can uh, uh, use in wheat as other crop models in this app and uh, uh, connect the, the uh, disease or use the insect pest model. Next. So then the, the, that's the idea, okay, to, to have this connection, okay, the, the a disease model uh, coupled uh, to a crop model in this app using uh, the pest module uh, routine, okay. So that's the, the idea was coupling this app, uh, simulation with disease cycle. And uh, we, we are using uh, one of uh, the crop models in this side that's uh, called Enwit. Next. So, uh, uh, although it's, it seems uh, simple, it's usually it's, that, that's not very simple, okay? Uh, so over the years, we, we tried uh, different uh, technical coupling solutions, okay? We, uh, we use the uh, uh, like databases. Uh, we use web sockets, and uh, we use uh, the uh, JNI Java native interface. Uh, they all worked, but uh, they were not uh, very flexible, and uh, it, it, some of them they need a lot of uh, hard coded. And also, we had some perform perform issues. Okay, it was gonna it was taking. Uh, was penalizing the model in terms of performance uh, was uh, taking too long for uh, running these simulations. The next. 
uh, nowadays we, we I, I think we, we have something much better now we are using some uh, communicate existing communication protocols uh, such as MPI that uh, means a message passage interface uh, and then that gives us the ability to communicate models uh, during the execution time and this simulation models can be written in different languages like uh, Fortran, C++, Java, uh, so on. So, and uh, the nice thing about is that we are, we are able to uh, to prepare or to configure it in the same way that uh, uh, it's uh, used uh, in this side. So there was uh, minimal changes in the, the prop model coding and also there was minimal change in the DSAT uh, uh, platform. Uh, we know that there are no ideal technical coupling solutions, but this right now seems that it's working well for us. And uh, just showing this picture here, for example, uh, we have uh, uh, NWIT uh, crop model. I have a inocul model that model the uh, models the uh, airborne inocul of uh, with blast, for example, and uh, we have this GDM that uh, stands for generic disease model. So all these models they are uh, written in different language. The NWIT is written in Fortran. The inocul is written in C++, and uh, uh, Norco is written in R and GDM is written in C++. Uh, so they are all connected by MPI, okay, in the memory. So it's very fast. Uh, it's almost, uh, you, you do not notice that uh, the, you know, the disease is on or is off. Okay, we can have the set this option in the configuration file for uh, this side. Uh, and uh, so we can apply this, uh, 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 putting all these uh, models together, we can uh, couple this, uh, using this coupling solution, we, we can have a, a, a prediction of uh, the impact of disease on, on wheat yield, for example. Next. So we're going to show you a practical example of some of this work. And this is, again, where I want to highlight our collaboration with the Bangladesh Wheat and Maize Research Institute. Um, but we, we several years ago embarked on a collaboration with BWMRI um, to plant sowing date trials of new, newly released wheat genotypes in three different locations in Bangladesh. And, we established this during the 2016-17 uh, wheat season uh, with uh, crops being grown in the north of the country, in the mid midpoint of the country, and then a bit further to the south. So we had a gradient of locations and mo more importantly, temperature regimes. And we started the crop on November 25th and then sequentially uh, it, it, period, periodic dates later from November 25th to December 5th, December 15th, 25th, and then finally on January 4th to look at the performance of these newly released cultivars in different locations um, and as a, as a function of sowing date. So it's a very sort of um, typical genotype by environment, by management sort of uh, experiments. And when we first designed and set out to work on these trials, we had intended to do so to generate information that could be useful for crop modeling applications more generally. And so we outfitted all of the locations with the requisite uh, uh, meteorological stations and collected so soil profile data, which would enable us to actually make use of the data collected for crop modeling purposes in addition just to uh, G by E by M analyses, which are equally and uh, most relevantly uh, useful from this work. Uh, in terms of the cultivars that we used, we picked a variety of new cultivars ranging from Bari Gom, Gom means wheat in Bangla, so Bari Gom 26, which is a quite wheat blast disease susceptible variety, ranging through a number of different other cultivars all the way up to Bari Gum 33. And Bari Gum 33 is unique because it is actually a 
wheat blast, resistant cultivar that was released in the last two years following the wheat blast incidents of 2016. And we recently also added a new cultivar, which is the Wheat and Maize Research Institute, or WMRI, cultivar number one. Um, so that's the background on those trials. And basically, what, what we did with those trials was we, we measured uh, a large amount of data, and then we worked with the modeling team and, and the, the interfaces and models that Mauricio just developed uh, and discussed to um, model the performance of the different varieties, but we focused quite a lot on Bari Gum 26, which again is quite wheat blast susceptible. So here you see some of the results from this work looking at simulated versus observed uh, performance of the, uh, the models and their uh, association with observed data. We have pretty good fits for phenology in terms of days to antithesis, days to physiological maturity, relatively good performance for yield, but we're still working on our canopy biomass measurements. Uh, and making some adjustments and improvements there because there may have been some slight errors in field measurements. But with this kind of information, we feel relatively comfortable in taking the next steps to using the models as something that can be, um, well, as, as something that can be used for applied modeling with respect to understanding disease and disease risks in the coupling interface that Mauricio just described. So to speak more about that, I'll go back to Mauricio. Well, so uh, we, uh, with that in mind, okay, with uh, this uh, coupling, that uh, wheat blast model coupling with the DSAT and wheat model, okay, so uh, we think that uh, it, it gives us uh, a next step, okay, so we can think about the uh, having the uh, the crop uh, simulation, the, uh, the wheat simulation, uh, using uh, uh, the sat in wheat, and also we can have the uh, wheat blast simulation. Okay, so we, we this uh, the wheat blast model. Uh, okay, they have this uh, a spoil cloud. Okay, we are trying to simulate this spoil cloud. We are trying to simulate the uh, the how the disease. Uh, uh, infects uh, the spikes, okay? So uh, all that information, uh, uh, <coughs> basically what the, the, <coughs> the, we, we, the, the, uh, the best module coupling point that we are affecting in the uh, wheat crop mo uh, model is seed mass, okay? So we doing the simulation if, uh, 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 it happens uh, infection, it, 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 there is an onset of infection in the simulation from the day of the infection on, okay, so we, uh, there is, we are penalizing, we are removing some of the seed mass. So depending on the time of infection and, and the number of, of infection points that we have uh, in our simulation, uh, that's going to be uh, the uh, the impact on uh, on the wheat crop, for instance, for example, if uh, the time of onset is early on the crop, okay, it's just at the beginning of the heading stage or uh, grain filling stage, uh, and that so that's the effect is going to be uh, significant on, uh, on uh, with the yield. If the infection is late or just with a few points of infection. The, the impact is not going to be as significant. So that's the way it's, it's set. So, uh, and everything is, uh, especially the, the wheat blast model is uh, uh, driven by uh, weather variables, okay? And of, so is the, the wheat crop model that's driven by weather variables and also other variables like soil and the thing, uh, soil variables and things like that. Next. Uh, so the uh, uh, the wheat blast here is just the uh, uh, website, uh, the wiring system uh, uh, website, and uh, so we there is a link, there is a link to so you can access the the model coupling or the crop model 
uh, and run some uh, virtual experiments uh, that uh, are in place in the uh, website. Next. Well, uh, so uh, we, we, since we, like Tim said, that we are reasonable, comfortable with this, uh, the, the way that the, uh, the NWIT model uh, uh, simulations outputs uh, when we compare with observer data. So we took it and uh, we did, uh, uh, we performed a virtual experiment. Uh, who, trying to mimic that experiment uh, with sewing date trial uh, uh, that Tim referred before. So we, we, we did a, this simulation over three different years, 2016, 2017, and 2018. And uh, we did the simulation with the disease off, okay? And uh, we run the same simulation as with the disease on. And then we took the yield, and we had a ratio of uh, uh, yield with disease on, uh, disease uh, by disease off. So if uh, there was no disease impact, the, the relative yield was going to be one. Uh, so you can see here that uh, in 2016, that, that there was the year, and we did that simulation for the, uh, with the location called Chasson in Bangladesh and uh, so we had the weather data for that location and also we had the soil profile so we were able to, to configure uh, we to provide all the inputs that that was required for running uh, that uh, simulation uh, experiment and uh, by that we, we were able to, to show that uh, in 2016 we could observe an impact on yield uh, due to wheat blast, and uh, that was not observed in 2017, it was not also observed in 2018, except for one of the sowing dates. Uh, so, of course, we, we can uh, have, <coughs> there is a need, uh, there's a room for uh, model fine tuning, okay, but that can give you some idea that uh, what we can, these models can be uh, ap applications for these models, okay, and uh, uh, we were able to, to show that in 2016 the disease was present uh, in the field, okay, and the, the simulations also show that uh, there was an impact of the disease. Another thing that uh, we can see that uh, uh, sowing date, later sowing dates are going to be more favorable for disease infection, and that's something that uh, by experience, we, we, we know now that uh, there is an indication for farmers that, that they should uh, sow as early as possible, uh, trying to escape this, uh, the infection of uh, by uh, minor poultry. Okay, so that's an example of uh, uh, using this, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, a full, I call it a full couple uh, uh, wheat model with uh, a wheat blast uh, model. Next. Uh, so, uh, what uh, are going to be the next steps? Uh, well, another application, a kind of application that I, I see for this kind of uh, uh, integrated models is uh, for uh, ex assessment uh, at uh, regional or even at a global scale, okay? Uh, in the past, one of the limitations that we have for running these more crop models was uh, having access to uh, soil profile data sets and also weather data sets. Uh, nowadays, okay, there is a, a global database of soil profile. This global database is uh, is uh, the soil profile, the, the soil variables, uh, or soil traits are estimated using pseudo transfer functions, okay? But that's a good estimation based in, on the soil characteristics, okay, in the soil maps. And uh, this uh, soil database is, is uh, in a grid uh, of 10 by 10 uh, kilometers, okay? So it's in a global scale. Uh, regarding to weather data, there are 
nowadays uh, some uh, the same thing okay with the soil data now we can have for using uh, results from reanalysis okay uh, there is a uh, availability of uh, weather data in a global scale okay also in a grid of 10 by 10 kilometers uh, for example there is this uh, called era 5 uh, it's a uh, website called Copernicus and uh, we can get uh, weather data from 2001 uh, to present in our hourly basis okay uh, so you can just select which variables you want to and uh, you can download this weather data so it's uh, so it's possible okay to to use this uh, in a regional basis or even a global scale but we are doing a uh, preparing a, a, a virtual experiment for instance in Bangladesh we select uh, uh, a grid uh, a big square in a, that covers more or less all the wheat growing area uh, in Bangladesh uh, and from that area we we download the weather data from 2001 to 2018 and that was a 10 by 10 kilometer uh, grid so we download solar radiation temperature relative humidity um, dew point temperature uh, and precipitation okay uh, so this is kind of a weather uh, data that uh, weather data that you need as input for the models and also we download the uh, soil profile uh, for each of these uh, grids. So in such a way, if we organize uh, this uh, 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 model, that the way that we, we did set up, so I can connect uh, these uh, with the, the whole configuration with the soil database and with the weather data, I, and I, I would be able to, to run uh, the model for each particular uh, individual grid, uh, little square, okay from 2001 to 2018 and we can see that uh, we could mimic uh, that uh, big epidemic outbreak in 2016 and also if there was other years before 2016 that would be as favorable for uh, wheat blast as what it was in 2016 and the disease didn't happen because the, the knockout was not there the pathogen was not there. Okay, so it is it's going to be a very good example of application, and uh, uh, so where crop modeling and disease models are put together, uh, so they can help us to understand better the disease, and uh, uh, and so we can make more uh, uh, make more better decisions about the, uh, what's going to be next. Next slide, please. Well, uh, there is uh, one limitation if you want to use just the, the, the configurations of these models like you have in, in this app, that's going to be take, take a long time to, to prepare all these models, uh, this configuration uh, to, to run all together. Uh, so there is uh, the group of the SAT University of Florida. Uh, they developed uh, a script in Python it's called PyTIA. And uh, so it's a, a parallel application, okay, that uh, we can run multiple instances of this app just at once. So it, it, the, the script, uh, so you can connect the script to, to database and uh, you can, uh, it's gonna prepare all the structure used by the SAT. And, uh, and also, uh, this uh, this script uh, is gonna is with using this script uh, it uh, uh, it recognizes in your computer how many cores you have and it's gonna be uh, uh, distributed it will distribute the uh, the applications the the, the runs uh, in the, according to the number of cores that you have in your computer uh, so it can set it can set all this. Uh, things together just by uh, getting this uh, it aggregates by latitude and longitude okay 
uh, and also it uh, after it runs and can provide the, the outputs some of the outputs you can select some of the of, uh, outputs and, uh, to be shown in the map next uh, so to to test that uh, we did a uh, 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 an experiment, a uh, virtual experiment. We use it here in Brazil, okay, uh, in the state of Paraná. Uh, and uh, we we took a, a grid here. The, it was uh, each square here was uh, twenty by twenty kilometers, and uh, we had about three hundred and fifty squares. And uh, it was. Uh, we, we did it for the year 2015 and 2016. We knew that in 2015, in the area northwest of uh, Paraná, we, the disease was present, okay, in that uh, app that you mentioned to you, the Pico Whitfield. If you go there, you, you go to 2015, you're gonna see the northwest of, uh, area of Paraná, there was uh, many points that uh, people uh, observe the, the disease in the field at that time. And 2016, it was the disease was not there, was not present. Okay, what in that year was a dry year, and also the temperature was low uh, in 2016. Uh, so we decided to to do this uh, 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 this experiment uh, to test the uh, this application. In, in Python and uh, using the SAT and using NWIT and the WIT bus model. Okay. Uh, and we did the same idea of uh, we run with the disease uh, off and then with the disease on and you had this ratio of yield. Okay. And again, if it is one, it means that there was no impact. And uh, so you can see here that in 2015, there was an impact, uh, okay? Uh, there was an impact on, on, on yield, okay? Especially in that area in the north of uh, uh, the state of Parana. Uh, and in 2016, uh, there was almost no, no impact. So uh, that, that was uh, one way to demonstrate that we could uh, use these uh, these models, uh, okay, in a grid, uh, and uh, here we use the uh, the numerical the weather data was obtained from numerical simulations, okay, uh, from the past, uh, and the soil data was obtained from the uh, that global uh, soil database, and just to give you an idea for each uh, for uh, the experiment. Uh, uh, for running one set with disease on or with disease off, uh, with disease on, it was about it took us about uh, six minutes, and uh, with disease off, uh, maybe about four minutes. Okay, so that's uh, consider that you are running to head and fifty executions. Okay, that was not, and that was a regular regular uh, computer desktop. Uh, if you have a server with uh, much with better, the performance is going to be much better. Or if you're going to use something like GPU, it's going to be seconds. So, uh, so it, it seems to us that uh, this kind of applications are doable. So that's, uh, I think, something very new that uh, uh, we had to, to show here in this uh, webinar. Thanks, Mauricio. So in conclusion and, and showing this work, it's still preliminary, but I think that we've got some, some strong and useful proof of concepts. Um, basically, the outcomes of the activity and the support of the, the big data platform has helped us work on an early warning system for wheat blast that has applicability and is now being used in both Bangladesh and Brazil. And that is a numerical weather forecast driven uh, early warning system model. Um, we've also aimed to couple that same system to the DSAT and wheat um, crop model that Mauricio just described, which has a, a wide variety of applications and can be very useful, uh, especially when coupled with Pythia 
to understand the potential geographic um, impact of disease, both in a hindcast and potentially also in a, in a future forecasting sense. Um, the DSAT and wheat um, model that we worked on um, was also successful in reproducing the general effects of sowing date trials on wheat phen phenology and yield across different locations in Bangladesh. So that gives us some confidence in the work that we are doing. Um, as Mauricio mentioned, there was a strong consistency uh, with higher yields and, um, and less disease pressure with earlier sowing dates. So the take home message with that is if you are growing wheat, at least in Bangladesh, you should attempt to try to sow your wheat early. That will avoid both disease risks and is also important, and there's a lot of literature on this, that it can also assist in reducing um, terminal heat stress, which also reduces yield. Um, with that work, we were able to roughly simulate the effects of wheat blasts on susceptible cultivars, and specifically Barigom 26, in a three-year multi-location uh, sowing date trial that we have now throughout Bangladesh. This work is continuing into the current wheat growing season at the end of 2019 and 2020, and we hope to combine all of that information um, together and produce a quite thorough um, report and write-up on, on our progress. Um, and I think I mentioned also the, the potential for the Python, um, Pythia interfaces to run the coupled DSAT and NWEAT wheat blast suitability models um, on a geographic and gridded locational basis that's made possible by having um, gridded climatic data and also gridded soil data and using these platforms in between to tie the two together and uh, help to um, provide results that are geographically and spatially relevant. Um, so we have that proof of, proof, of, proof of concept that's been done in Brazil, um, but we are now starting to work on doing the same in Bangladesh, which will be exciting as the results start to come in the next few months. So with that, we want to say thank you uh, to you for listening to this webinar. We'd like to highlight and give thanks to the big data um, in agriculture platform supported by the CGIAR. Um, this work has also been supported strongly by USAID and also with uh, alignment with the CCAF's um, uh, research program under the CGIAR. We'd also like to specifically thank a few individuals, including Harun Rashid. Um, D.B. Pandit and Shofiq Islam, who are with CIMIT in Bangladesh, and also Abdul Manan, Kamrul Hassan, and Shamsuddin Ahmed from the Bangladesh Meteorological Department, who have been very helpful in supplying weather data and climatic data so we can run our models. And we'd also like to recognize and thank um, Willington Pavan and Carlos Holbig, who are at the University Pasafondo who have been instrumental in helping a lot of this modeling work. Last and but not least, we'd like to thank S. Ishtiak and Arsen, who are with the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute, who were kind enough to supply the genetic coefficients for the Bangladeshi cultivars that were modeled in the sowing date experiments in the application of DSAT. Once again, I'll say thank you, thank you and Mauricio and I will both, I guess, say goodbye. Until next time. Thanks.